Hello everybody, this is Q&A number 10 and I am looking forward to it. I think you're learning so much from it. From what you've fed back to me, it's been great. So this is from a YouTube question from Bob, Bob Young. Um, I've watched all of your YouTube videos and saw, that w saw the one on how to prepare a new plane. What would you use to remove the sticky stuff? So you bought a new plane, it's covered in lacquer, and, that, and you need some way of getting the sticky stuff off. So usually it's a lacquer, and usually it will be dissolved with something like denatured alcohol. So almost any solvent, you could use the more uh, complex solvents, which I try to avoid, but meths will almost always remove it from, from the, uh, the plane body. If you want to keep it, the handles untouched by it, make sure you don't run meths onto the handles because that will gum them up but that's what I would use and then he goes into another question with a new plane would you go through the full process shown on your video um, to or just sharpen the blade well it depends on the make if it's a Stanley then you will need to go back you'll need and a record and people like Irwin all those modern day makers that no longer actually make but prepare them uh, for sale but don't really refine the plane. You'd have to go in there and flatten the sole. If it's a premium maker, perhaps a Lee Nilsson or something like that, then the plane will come flat and you don't have to worry about it. So it's just a question of where you bought your plane. So you're talking basically about new planes and those are the things you do have to go through to initialize your plane. Once you've done it, you've got it for life. All right, uh, this is from Don. Paul, I looked, but I did not see anywhere on your site where you discuss hand-cutting bridle joints. And um, the reason so far has been that people actually don't use them as much, or I don't, we don't use them as much as we would, say, a mortise and tenon. But I'll, I'm going to show you how to make one because I think it's good to have it there. They're not complicated, but usually a bridle joint comes, or in the middle of a long section of wood. So if we've got, um, this is a long section, you want to put intermittent vertical posts in there, you would take this midsection out of here, and then you'd take the, the outside sections on the opposite piece. So this piece would then slide into this one. So let's take a look at this. This is, I'm gonna cut this one for you. I've prepared everything, I've got my shoulder lines in, and. Um, I've made this, uh, I've got my lines exactly where I want them. Now I laid this out the other day and actually it's diminished a little bit. This piece has shrunk so this piece probably did as well but I'm still gonna go through with it because I want you to see how it's done. So I've got my knife wall in here. Cut into the knife walls like this and this. Take a small saw, just a dovetail saw will work. Try not to go past your depth line. Flip over and do the same to the other side. And I think Use a chisel hammer like I'm doing for this side. I'm just showing you different options, especially if you're not used to working with hand tools. Just flick those out of the way, like that. And then nudge the saw right up against that knife wall there, carefully. Again, stay to your depth line. I'm going to show you a couple of options. You can go in here like this, just to weaken the fibers just a little bit and break the lineage of the long grain going across. Then you can pop this about halfway down, so this is quarter of an inch deep, say, so I've gone down one eighth of, a, of an inch, and I've given myself a line here, so then, just pop that with the heel of your hand, 
or use a chisel hammer, aim for the sky. So I'm going from low point to high point. See this here, instead of taking a full width cut across here, I'm feeling resistance, I go over here and I just take a side swipe to the outside edge and that works perfectly. So I've not gone to depth yet and now I'm going right into the groove that I made with a, mark, with a, a mortise gauge. So I'm in that groove, and that's not the name of a song. Okay. I remember back in the 60s when all the songs that came out were always groovy. Okay. So I've got this incline from one side. So now I turn around and work from the other side. There's the gauge line. There's my gauge line there. So I'm going to drop down on this side now and do exactly the same, about halfway down, about one eighth of an inch, pop it, pop it, and pop it. Take out the bulk of the upper waist first. And then drop it into that last layer. into the groove. I'm right in the groove now from the gauge line. So here, heel of my hand. Now if you're not used to this, you may not have built up the necessary fibre strength in, or whatever it is in here to do what I'm doing. So you do have to work on that development. Not quite deep enough on this side. So your personal safety, take care of yourself. Take out this midsection. See this, so I've, I've taken a full width cut here. And now I'm taking off little swipes with the corner of my chisel. And look how this wood comes out, it's, per it's very nice. So now I'm shooting towards the opposite side. And it takes a little practice to get this level with the opposite side. You don't want that midsection fat. So then we reach for the first cordless router ever invented here. So this we drop down. until we're just level, just above the surface. Hopefully I've left this as a slight rise in the middle. So I go, oh this is so nice. This. I love the sound of a cordless router. They are wonderful. No, don't go all the way through, do like I did, work from both sides. and work carefully. So now I know this is dead level. And um, I can take another fraction off when I come to fit. I'm just cleaning up that outside, or that the outside width of the recess. So that's one part done, and now I do the same on this side. This time I'm not going to do sequential cuts. I'm just gonna do one cut on each side. I've already cut them. <laughs> So this time I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I take some of this down. Now use your chisel hammer until you've built up the kind of strength you want. This takes out some of the top fibers that might be resisting you and then halfway down Pop it with the heel of your hand or your chisel hammer. Now I'm looking at the grain and I'm seeing it's tearing a little bit more, which gives me some insight into what I can expect. And I'm trying to determine, I'm trying to read the grain when I'm working this. I read the grain, 
I look at how the fibers work. Are they with me or against me? Because look at this knot, this is going to have an effect down here, but it depends. If I bring my chisel in, if I'm cutting from this side, look at those hard growth rings that I'm hitting here. When I come from this side, I'm hitting it very differently. So this side would actually probably be easier to split than coming from that side. So I'll see that in a minute. But these are all the ways that we work with wood. And the reason we do this is we love it because we want to be able to relate to the material in the same way we might do with music. Now look at this here. Can you see the grain on this side, how it, the surface is fractured slightly? And this side, it's super smooth. And that is to do with this grain, as I was talking about. So I'm already reading the grain as I work. This is what makes the difference to me as a craftsman. So I slide my chisel right into the gauge line now, just popping it with my hand. And this is peeling very differently than it did on the other side. And this is what you wanted when you started woodworking. You didn't want three million bits all over the shelves in your workshop. And here we are, we're going. So this will actually tell me too, can you see what's happening to, <coughs> to the fibers this side now? They're much smoother when I come from this side because of the way the chisel is hitting the material and the growth rings. So I'm doing a lot from this side this time because it feels so much nicer. All right, so we are very close to the full depth. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pull my plane from your side here. Yeah, I'm gonna change this a little bit. I still need to go down more on this side, which is what I was avoiding cutting because it wasn't as pleasant. I'm in the groove here. Right in this corner is not cut deep enough, so I'm gonna just pull the knife here that will take me down, make sure that I'm not breaking out up here, hopefully. There, perfect. So I am down into my gauge line on this side fully. So I could, you could say that I am engaged, right? Into the gauge line. Watch what happens now. So I've got this down on that side, and now I can work from the favorable side and I use it just like I do the chisel. See that slicing motion that I'm getting? So I'm getting a very nice, clean, clean surface. I'm gonna use my chisel now. Just knock some of the high spot. That's a little bit too thick. See that slicing motion again? So I'm working with the grain to get clean cut. Watch what happens now, I'm gonna come from your side here. I'm just gonna peel into that. Pair those fibers down. There. I'm coming from that side again now. So now I'm making sure the surface is exactly the same depth from this side as it was from the other side. So those are my two surfaces cut. I can still see my pencil line on the hair, just a hair. So now we're gonna focus on this fella here. This is the one that's going to be going over this here. Now I use the same gauge that I use, so watch what happens first here. So I go to a tenon saw now, another tool that we introduce here. And I'm going right on the line Over the top, same on this side. I'm gonna angle my wood this way now. What I want to do, can you see here, I have got my gauge line here. I want, this is the part I'm removing. So I'm, I want to see this line, just barely see it after I finish the cut. 
So I'm, I've got the line across the top sewn into. So I'm going to follow this line from this position here and I start dropping my hand, dropping, dropping to make sure I follow that line until I've gone from corner to corner. Can you see that? I'm going to do the other one while I'm in this position for economy of movement. Keep dropping that hand, make sure the saw doesn't tell you which direction it's going to go and certainly make sure the wood does not give you instruction. It's you that has dominance. So over the top again, follow the line again. Corner to corner. And once you're down, it's just a question of sewing from side to side and your saw will automatically follow. Look at that, I just have enough depth on my saw too. That wasn't planned that way. All right, so we take the midsection out now. We need a 3 8 chisel. And if we have one, we'll be doing great. I should have pulled this out before. There's one. Chisel hammer. Start away from your line. Go halfway through. Then work the incline to a more perpendicular Cut. So we took out that bulk of the waste to remove resistance. So now I'm going right into a knife wall and I'm, I'm sighting this face of the chisel, hopefully with my gauge line, with my knife wall. Doesn't matter if it goes under. Flip over, bevel up with your knife, with your chisel. Oh, I love it, don't you? This is so lovely. If you could see in here, look at this, beautiful. Straight, dead straight incline right in the bottom of the hole. I love it. That's, this is what craftsmanship, creative artisanry is all about. It's about you feeling, touching, enjoying the process. You are engaging with your material. We are in the knife wall again. We're through to the other side. And look what we got. So we've got this crystal clear. Let's see what we get on this surface here now. So this should go into here like this. And we have our bridle joint. A little bit of shrinkage on my material from the other day. That's our bridle joint done. So now we're ready to glue and clamp and do everything we need to do. Uh, and that's it. So several of those, you can make frames, you can do all kinds of things with. We've got another questioner that came in with something very similar to this, uh, or, or will relate to this. Uh, this is from Matt Rockwell, and he says, when using hand tools, how do you surface intersecting grains without tear out? This might be for inlay work or on a tabletop or a mitre's intersection in the face of a picture frame. To make matters worse here in North, Northwest USA, we're particularly fond of using fir and cedar. Well, I know America and I know Americans, and I also know that people use all types of different woods. So what I've got is I've just made this bridle joint. This surface is slightly higher than this one. So I'm going to level this. One of the things about hand tools, if you have your tool sharp and you make sure it's not overset before you start, I'll show you what I shoot for. You have to make sure your plane is 
barely taking a shaving there. See, that's too much. There's my plane set. So this is working nicely. You can plane a cross grain here as long as you skew the blade like this. So I'm going across here and I'm not getting any tear out. Now it might be that I could also plane this way and get less tear out. Um, this is working fine. This level is lower than this. So I need to take this down. I could just come in this way first of all and take this down. But when I come to, as you call the, the opposing grain or grain that's not in line, I may have to change that strategy. And there are different elements to grain. Pine isn't particularly easy for this. Oak, for instance, or cherry would be a lot easier. But do you see how I skew my plane here? So I have the side of my plane iron is actually taking off this level. The bulk of my plane iron is taking out this midsection here. So as long as I'm skewing, if I went this way, I'll do it in a second, and you can see what I mean. Here, this one is slightly higher than this one, so I skew my plane this way, and that's giving me a perfect finish. There is no discrepancy. So what happens? So now I can go from this area, I can go out this way, and take this other surface down, and they're perfectly level, and that's how we do it. We negotiate, we work with the grain. What happens if I go across the grain here, square across? Can you see it's breaking out? So I bust it out like it just blew out on the other side, and that's, can you can hear the difference here. You can hear the difference. You cannot plane straight, so you have to go. Can you hear the difference now? So I'm correcting my issue. And I've got a perfect surface. So it's skewing the blade here. That's the main thing. If I go here, across here, and give it a little bit more support here, we can, do the, we can achieve the same negative result. So here, again, I'm tearing the grain. This is torn here. The surface fibers are torn. I've got to go in at a skew. And this is when we do skew the plane for this type of surface. So that takes care of that question. Great. So we have, somebody here was asking earlier about, um, I just started carving wooden spoons and uh, they keep cracking. How do you keep them from cracking? I'm gonna question this a little bit more. Um, when does the cracking occur? Is it during the making process or after you've made the spoon? This is important. Uh, if it happened during the process, then it seems you need to adjust your technique to less aggressive mode because sometimes we are pounding on this and it starts to crack. But if it's after, uh, the, after you've soon completed the spoon, it could be that the moisture content is still too high in the spoon and you carved it down or you carved it down and that means that that area of the spoon is um, contrary with other aspects of it. So parts are drying earlier on one part than the other. And in this case, you simply put the spoon, after you've carved it, put it into a plastic bag, seal it up, leave it overnight. In the morning, open the bag, let it ventilate, and then close the bag again. And you'll keep seeing moisture on the inside of the bag and you'll know it's not dry. And once it's dry, you'll see that moisture disappear, and that's it. That's, that's all there is to it. So that terminates this session, number 10 on questions and answers. And if you want more, go to my blog, go to my YouTube channel, more, and you'll find all kinds of interactive ways that we're sharing the good news about how we work with wood using hand tools. Thank you for watching. <laughs>